Okay. Um, hello. Um, thanks very much for the organizers for inviting me to this very interesting conference. I enjoyed all of the talks. Uh, so it was very, like, really very good for me. I learned a lot. Um, this is on hydrodynamic simulations of super bubbles. Um, um, the background shows you one impression of uh, one of our 3D hydrodynamic simulations. And I had a perfect introduction to this talk uh, by two uh, excellent talks about super bubbles. So my introduction uh, will be very short. Um, I quickly remind you of some um, classical models, you can say, so it wants to have been around for a long time. And uh, then I would like to focus on our um, 3D hydrodynamic simulations of super bubbles. And in contrast to the previous um, speaker, my interest uh, is, especially for this talk, uh, to um, tell you about the detailed physical processes that happen in a super bubble. In particular, I will do a detailed comparison uh, to the self-similar model uh, that um, uh, our previous speakers have been talking about as well, and about the particular features that we see in the hydrodynamic simulation, uh, which have not been seen before. And this is uh, what is the um, uh, clumping instability, the vision instability, clumping of the shell, uh, the thermal X-ray properties, um, expectations for cosmic rays, uh, which we find. Yes, we will hear more later in this conference about. Uh, and also um, the relation to aluminum 26, uh, which is the only way we have to measure actually hot gas velocity in supermodels. Um, so, a um, very old model from the um, 70s is the um, self similar models of probable expansion, and as my uh, preceding speakers have stressed, this relies on an average um, energy input, so you just need to assume a kinetic uh, luminosity that the star cluster produces, and um, uh, then you can show that you get a self-similar solution, uh, that the self-similar solution exists, and uh, the structure is basically the same as for the stellar wind. So you have a kinetic driving region, there's a shock which um, thermalizes the energy of uh, the um, shock um, wind, uh, cluster wind, or uh, shock stellar winds uh, fill most of the super bubbles. There's a contact surface which separates the injector from the ambient medium. The ambient medium uh, has a shock, a forward shock running into it. Uh, and uh, this is the region in uh, this uh, classical model uh, where you have cooling. Uh, so um, this also limits cooling. And um, the self similar solution you get is um, here. So it's um, a proportional to this kinetic uh, luminosity you put in uh, to time to the power of three fifths and inversely proportional to the density of one fifth, power of one fifth. And if you plug in reasonable numbers, um, then it has been shown that you can get a size which compares um, to the order of magnitude reasonably well um, to non-super bubbles, and these people have shown it. Um, super bubbles are so big that one of their characteristics is, of course, they become comparable to scale height. And this has been studied with numerical models in the 80s. This is uh, from a paper of McLovin all uh, 89. Uh, so we have a uh, spherical driver region in a stratified disk. We have seen this much better. Uh, the super bubble breaks out, and there's a comparison to a thin shell approximation for which you don't need hydrodynamic simulation, but just uh, evolve the shell surface according to the pressure. Uh, and uh, when the super bubble breaks out, it accelerates the shell. You get really Taylor instability that you expect actually in a uh, exponential atmosphere that the shell dissolves and the clumps fall back and I think that's what we've seen in much more sophisticated simulation in the previous part. So um, let's go to 3D simulation of um, super bubbles and uh, these ones uh, I do in a homogeneous atmosphere and um, since I will be talking quite a bit about it I give you some details about how we set up these simulations. 
Uh, we solved the equations of hydrodynamics in 3D with the parallel AMR code, uh, the AMR in this case. Um, the um, equations for mass conservation get an input uh, for mass loading in the driving regions for the winds. Uh, the um, conservation of energy equation is modified uh, or contains the term due to photoelectric heating uh, and, assuming, um, and uh, cooling due to atomic and molecular um, cooling processes down to the train. And there's an energy input of stars, and for both we have um, input from stellar models. Um, in this case, these are uh, non rotating stars from the Geneva models. This is a typical energy input curve, and there's a similar, uh, similar curve for mass input. Uh, so this is energy in supernova units, so this is one supernova unit. 60 solar mass um, during its all star wind phase are uh, injected by 1.5 um, supernova units, so more than the supernova. As we have and um, then there's a work brigade phase, uh, which also injects a significant amount of energy. And then on top of this, there's uh, the supernova energy. And this is uh, similar for the other stars, of course, but for lower mass, also massive stars, the supernova energy actually dominates. So this uh, we inject in the following setup. We have a 400 um, parsec cube box. And we do different resolutions. The best resolution we get to be half parsec. The mean energy per stellar mass is about 10 to the 36 Earth per second per massive star. Per, per star above uh, 8 solar masses. And um, so if you then ask yourself what kind of um, stellar configuration does this correspond to, so what I've just shown, uh, I should take three massive stars that corresponds to about a star cluster of about 1,000 solar masses or a few thousand solar masses. Um, so we put these uh, massive stars into the grid, and for the first simulation that I will show you, we put uh, them uh, at distances, characteristic distance of about 30 parsec in this setup, and that's ambient density, which is um, uh, homogeneous throughout the box. Uh, the density is 10 particles per cube centimeter, the temperature is 121K, and this is uh, the equilibrium temperature for this uh, density. Each star has a driver region of 16 parsecs, so they are sufficiently far apart that the driver region is not overlap. This is not a model for a particular simple bubble, uh, but 30 parsecs um, spread is about typical for OB application. Uh, so, yeah, we um, we do this for various for various um, configurations. Um, so, but this would be typical for an OB application. Driver region, this is um, the region where we actually do apply the source term. So the energy input and the mass input, so it's, it's constant throughout this driver region with a diameter of 16 parsecs. So you can see that we resolve it uh, with about uh, 30 cents. So this is how the simulations look like. Uh, so initially, uh, so first I should explain what we see. So on the right, we see a density slide through the mid-plane of the simulation. It uh, contains uh, all the three bubbles for most of the time. On the left, we see um, a um, surface density, so that's uh, the integral of the density along one of the axes. And the camera rotates around these um, super bubbles, so that you get a 3 d impression of the super bubble, uh, and um, you can see it also from different, different um, so we first have, so let's show this again, uh, so this first uh, gives, us with it, uh, gives us individual bubbles. Uh, we see bubble merging, uh, it's very nice here, the interface is below, and we get a flow of hot gas uh, from the uh, biggest super bubbles into the smaller super bubbles. Um, this is at, um, at typical velocities of a uh, few hundred um, kilometers per second, and we've seen this um, similar in um, 
common simulation. Ah, it's one thing we see here, and uh, this is uh, just before the first supernova is closed, uh, is the spikes in the shell. And these um, spikes are not, uh, at least not purely numerical artifacts. Um, this is um, what you expect from the visionary instability. And uh, this has seen around the first time when we did these simulations, also other simulations. <coughs> and uh, the condition to get the visionary clumping instability is that you have a high over density. Depending on the actual um, energy input, um, it's about a factor of 20 you need. And you need to have high resolution in your numerical simulation uh, in order to squeeze your uh, gas mass to a small enough volume that you actually get the whole density and you can see the vision against the ability of the simulation. You had a question? Uh, so, uh, in the previous uh, slide, uh, when you say that the primary thing is 60 parsec, and you are including the one who are the terror when you make the within that 60 parsec, do you add that energy on top of the background density, or do you uh, like evaporate that energy before? No, we just add the energy and the density to what is already there, so um, which is for a short time uh, probably a bad idea. So it gives probably for a short time an unrealistic situation. But actually, the drive as soon as you add energy there, the driver region dominate the immediate surrounding. So um, after a very short time, uh, the um, you have only the mass that you inject actually in the driver region. And uh, it spreads out from uh, My worry was that when you add energy to such high density, okay, you're going to lose the uh, energy because of the radiation, the radiation cooling region uh, yeah. within the driver region. Absolutely. So that would actually uh, Yeah, that is a very small fraction. We can see this in terms later. Uh, but if you look at the, um, at the initial distribution of the bubbles, um, you can see you can see this a little bit here. So by now, one million years, um, this has actually uh, completely relaxed to the asymptotic solution, and we're um, simulating this So, um, yeah. So sorry, I want to. Uh, so right, this is the end of the. Um, this is just before supernova one. So now you have to. Um, uh, Watch um, very quickly because now the supernova comes and the evolution uh, is very quick. So what will happen is that the um, supernova will actually, uh, a supernova shockwave will uh, pass through this um, uh, through the super bubble and accelerate um, the shell here. And what will happen is because of the acceleration, you get very really Taylor instabilities, and that producing produces a mixing layer. Uh, in on the inside of this super shell, and this mixing layer will then will later on spread out through the entire super bubble and dominate the gas density. Uh, so here it was, and um, since it was very short, um, let's wait for supernova two to appear. Here, supernova two, it impacted um, the shell wall, and the blue stuff, the, the blue fuzzy stuff that you can see here. That's the entrained gas uh, that's entrained by accelerating by the ready Taylor instability uh, into the super bubble. And um, I would like to emphasize here it's the mixing layer is clearly resolved. And so we see the ready Taylor instability developing here. The mixing layer here is also the most important uh, part of the simulation because, as it turns out, um, this is actually what dominates the cooling in such a super bubble. So uh, you only get uh, you only can cool so much in the shock layer, but when you mix uh, the hot gas in the super bubble that carries the thermal energy uh, with dense gas in the shell uh, that's dense enough to, to do the cooling, uh, that's why you can actually dissipate most of the energy in the super bubble. Uh, so let's carry on from here. Um, so we have a third supernova because it's three stars. Uh, it just happened, and there's um, more mixing as the second picture. Um, and um, as um, the, so now there's no um, stellar driver left, 
uh, the superbug is still expand for a certain time. And uh, so we have it we have the simulation about uh, uh, seven many years after the last supernova and it still expands in the city. So this will be visible for some time after the main star activity in the sea. Um, let's uh, talk a little bit about the um, column density picture. So what you expect for a radiative shock wave in a more spherically symmetric model would be a particle scale very big shell. But because you have this um, visioning instability which clumps and distorts the shell, you actually get a much wider shell. And um, this should be something that should be actually observable, for example, in H1, if you um, observe such, um, such shells. Now we come back. So, I've said that the dissipation in the mixing layer is really strong. How strong is it actually? This is um, a track of energy on time. The solid curve is the input energy for this simulation, and the dotted curve here is the energy that we measure in this simulation. The difference is what has been radiated away uh, by cooling, and uh, mainly in the mixing layer. Um, so we see that um, first there's, um, there's strong cooling um, in the uh, post-star phase already. Uh, whenever a supernova um, comes, uh, we first get a, an energy input according to what we put in in the supernova, but then the energy declines on a time scale of about something like 100,000 years, few hundred thousand years for the later, um, for the later supernova. Uh, this plot here shows the ratio of energy uh, of the two curves here. So, um, what's the fraction of energy that we retain in the simulation? Uh, there's a feature here um, in the first mega year, which is related to how we set up the simulation. Uh, after each supernova, uh, we get to a high fraction, uh, but then we go down to a few percent uh, in each case here, uh, with a uh, longer decay, energy decay time uh, for bigger supernovas. So, does it actually matter that I've exploded the supernova in a superbubble? What would have happened if I had done single star simulation and uh, looked at the energy evolution for single stars? So we've done this experiment here. Uh, so this is this compares single star uh, supernova with different configuration with characteristic separations of uh, 60 parsecs, uh, 30 parsecs, and what you, you've just seen, and zero parsecs. This is where we put all the stars on top of each other. Um, you can see that there are differences in the energy tracks over time. And the solid line here is the line for the single star uh, cases, where each star is in a separate box, and we add up the energy um, that they retain in their simulation boxes. And uh, the uh, blue uh, dashed line here, uh, which is the highest energy line, is the one uh, where we have the uh, stars on top of each other. So there's a spread that you can have by uh, arranging stars in different configurations at different distances. And uh, the most energy efficient uh, thing that you can do is to have the stars on an, in an unresolved small uh, space. And this is uh, dividing the curves uh, through one another. So um, you can get at most an enhancement of the energy retained in the simulation box by a vector of about um, two um, at um, mega year timescales after each supernova. Uh, now, there's two curves here which um, basically are the same, and these are the curves for the third part of the separation for that realistic. Uh, size of OB association and the zero parsec um, separation. Now, I think that's interesting um, because it tells you that um, where you actually put your stars, if you put them uh, really close to each other or at a separation of 30 parsecs in an OB association, it doesn't matter. You get the same <coughs> energy retained in the simulation for all these configurations. Uh, this saves us quite a lot of work, but we don't need to try out any other, any, any other configuration. 
uh, within this um, kind of simulation. And this is the fractional difference uh, between these um, two simulations. Uh, so they are really on the percent range, and you can't, and this is uh, way uh, less than the accuracy I would uh, describe to our result. Um, so, yes, there's more energy retained in a super bubble compared to single star case. Let's compare this to the self similar model. Um, clearly, we get more dissipation. For the interstellar simulation, uh, we haven't had So, um, I wouldn't be surprised if the exact size um, where this matters depends. Okay, so let's compare these results to the um, self similar model. And um, because um, we see such strong dissipation in our results, I label the um, classical self similar model. The weekly dissipation model, and um, there's a, a great paper on that by Monica and Cole and Dick um, McRae. Um, and um, so they set out um, the thing that we've talked about a uh, lot actually, which is uh, also uh, described by Yuri here on the, on, on the blackboard uh, in uh, the second uh, sentence of the abstract, and I just read it to you for the fun of it. Um, because supernova blast waves usually become subsonic before reaching the walls of the shell or cooling radiatively, we may reasonably approximate the energy input from supernovae as a continuous luminosity. So um, let's look at that in detail. So this is a sort of similar model, so it means it doesn't care of how it, how it things begin. Uh, it assumes you are in a continuous state. So. You start by saying that, well, we have already a hot gas, hot gas bubble, given a uh, massive star cluster with a lot of massive stars, that's a uh, reasonable assumption. Uh, so this means the internal energy is actually bigger than the energy contribution of each individual supernova. Therefore, the supernova shock will be quickly subsonic. It will not have any strong effects uh, on the shell. Instabilities, uh, mixing, stuff like that will not happen. Uh, it basically uh, continuously increases the energy of the supernova. Uh, this means um, the uh, uh, self-similar model is valid, and there's therefore weak dissipation, about one third of the power input. Um, and this means at the end uh, you have more energy than you started with. So this means you have increased energy content for the next supernova. Uh, you have to reinforce your initial conditions. So this is a uh, Perfect circle. Once you once you're in it, um, it, the argument works perfectly. So now let's look at this for our strongly dissipated um, super bubble models. In this case, we start out with an internal energy that's less than the energy of each individual supernova. This means every supernova increases the pressure in the bubble strongly. Uh, the supernova shockwave thunders through the super bubble and accelerates uh, the shell strongly when it impacts on it. This acceleration causes the instabilities at the turbulent mixing layer. And now the turbulent mixing layer is responsible for strong dissipation. Uh, and, uh, and as well, we have resilient radiated losses in the shell shock. Um, uh, therefore, the super, ener super bubble energy is still small. When the next supernova comes, uh, you're again back at the, at the point where you start, that the internal energy is smaller than the supernova energy of internal. So both are perfect circular arguments, and uh, you need somehow need to establish the initial conditions to decide what's true. Um, so here is a reminder of our energy curve. Um, what does it mean for the um, bubble sizes? Is it significant? Uh, yes, it is significant. Uh, so for the weekly dissipative model, uh, you get 90% of the elevated uh, radius of the self similar model. Uh, for our model, uh, this is a comparison of radius over time. As uh, so you see that you still get the T23 bit law that's preserved, uh, as Yuri also um, has mentioned for his uh, 
simulations. Uh, this is the case uh, for no dissipation analytic model and uh, the process are from our simulation and if you do the ratio you get uh, on average something like 62 percent. Uh, so this is a, a significant reduction um, of the radius of the super bubble uh, in uh, this in these simulations. And um, if you uh, remember what Penny has said in her talk, I think this um, agrees better with observations. So at least it goes some way towards solving the power problem. So what happens when you vary the uh, conditions and uh, people have some simulation? Uh, that's uh, one in the previous talk uh, we have seen uh, the work by Mardilia and Louis uh, Beeman. And um, uh, so they vary the supernova frequency, so all simulations are appropriate for a 10 to 3 solomonic cluster. And uh, they have increased the supernova frequency uh, towards uh, basically the equivalent of a 10 to the 6 solomonic cluster. Uh, so the blue, green, and red lines are for increasing supernova frequency. Uh, they don't have the winds here, but um, overall the results are similar. So um, during 10 to the 6 years about, you go down to about 10% of the input energy, which is about what we get after, after um, 10 to the 6 years. Um, so, um, I think the result is here that um, uh, this is a quite general result. Uh, so even if the supernova um, actually these uh, energy decline curves, even when they overlap, um, there's still uh, this um, uh, weak, this strong dissipation. And uh, I don't have the simulation movies here, but if you um, remember your talk. Um, even in the highest supernova frequency case, you could see that the mixing layer actually developed at the shell surface, at least I was shown for it. Um, it's very quickly then compressed by the next supernova into the, um, into the shell wall, but that also accelerates the shell, creates new mixing layer. Um, so, uh, this is, I think this is uh, a fairly um, general result, therefore. So what about um, galactic winds? So uh, one uh, thing that um, puzzled me when I had these results was, okay, um, we get a very low um, fraction of retained energy in our superbubble simulation. Um, what happens if you scale it up? You have a lot of star clusters, and um, you produce a galactic wind. Uh, people who study galactic winds tell me that uh, you need more than 10% of the super and lower energy produced in order to drive the galactic wind. And uh, the conclusion I draw from this is that this picture, where you have lots of super bubbles interacting in, uh, at the time of observation in the center, in the star of the such a galactic wind, is clearly wrong. Uh, so the picture must be that if there's a, a shell uh, or super bubble structure at all, then the shell must be on a much larger scale, if it's there at all. And uh, what happens is, I believe, that um, this is the time scale where um, the wind is going for more than 10 million years. So all the interaction and shell expansion has already happened. Uh, the shell, uh, if there is one, has left the galaxy. And if dissipation happens, then it will happen uh, when uh, this material interacts with the shell out here. And this uh, efficiency of 10 percent that we get is not relevant for Starburst cores where the, where the clusters uh, will be uh, naked, so to say. They are no longer embedded, they no longer have shells in there that interact with dissipate energy. Um, okay, uh, there's caveats for these results, and I think the um, most important worry is the resolution dependence. So we studied the resolution dependence in our paper. Uh, in 2013, and so these curves are different curves uh, for dip, so energy tracks uh, for different resolutions, so increasing the resolution by a factor of two, three times. And uh, if you sit in the front row, you see the differences between these lines. If you see the back row, focus on this plot. Uh, this is uh, a high res over low res fraction, and it goes from 1 to 1.6. 
and it shows that at the end of the simulation, uh, you get for a factor of four increase in resolution, you get a factor of uh, six, you get 60% more in, in, in the retain in the simulation. Well, I think this is a valid criticism, and uh, the paper by Gentry as well, which has just appeared uh, on uh, ASCO PH, uh, they have um, a Lambrosian poll, so they can uh, increase the resolution in the um, in the mixing layer, so that's that's probably better. They reach uh, uh, how they only reach a resolution of about one parsec. They do it for the hydrodynamic case, for the MHD case. Uh, here are their energy tracks, and they are tracks, and they are still resolution dependent. So they basically see the same effect as we do. Um, so um, there is a resolution dependence, and it goes in the way that the better you resolve, um, the um, more energy you retain in the simulation. So you go towards the original um, simulation. So this is a real worry, so I think this needs to be done better to get more security here. Additionally, we should uh, we are limited by physics. Uh, so as Sally has shown, there will be photoionization layers, uh, which will actually um, change the structure uh, of the super model, exactly of the mixing layer. And these are additional effects um, that come into play. So this is the model that we have, and I think we can only compare it uh, to simulation, to, to observations, and try to do better models in the future. Okay, so one uh, interesting feature about the simulation is the vision of trunk and visibility. So I'm now going to do a few things um, uh, in order to demonstrate what our simulations actually show. Compare, try to compare it to observations. So the shells clump and we have much bigger radio. How does that compare much bigger thickness of the shell? So how does that compare to observations? I would like to bring a few observations here. Um, so this is again the column density uh, of one of our simulations. And um, so the characteristic thing is that in the column density, um, you see uh, clumps um, near the shell wall, you see a thick shell, and probably if you can't resolve it well, you only see a thicker shell than you would expect uh, from a um, cooling uh, wind shell. And uh, this is a Rosetta Nebula, a super bubble with the star cluster you see here. Uh, there's an optical image. And um, okay, I don't think we understand that completely. It goes into a nebula structure here. Uh, but we see, if you focus on these uh, black uh, lanes here and uh, these linear structures here, I think we see some of the sedimentary structure that we expect from the vision of instability uh, in this case. If we look at the, this um, uh, super bubble, I think it's in the LMC or SMC, um, uh, the blue is the X rays, and uh, so it, it fills the super bubble. Um, red is the H alpha, and the H alpha actually sh also shows these kinds of filamentary structures. So it seems to be there. This is an H, uh, sorry, this is an H1 uh, picture, H1 image of a very nearby um, super bubble in the upper Scorpius loop. Uh, that's a star cluster inside here. Um, the upper Scorpius um, group of the um, Scorpius and Taurus OB2 association. Uh, also about thousand solar masses. And um, so this shell here, the Apostorcus loop, uh, is um, resolved in H1. And that's the gas survey. And um, if you, I think it's fair to say that we see clumpy structure in the shell um, in the shell of this, this object here. Um, there's a um, bubble survey by Churchwell. Um, they do 322 bubbles in the infrared. And they find a thickness of about 20 to 40 percent on the shell, which I think argues that this thing appears quite thin. Um, again, I should uh, uh, tell you the caveat here. So, vision instabilities, we are really happy. We see them with high resolution. It's not guaranteed you get them. If you have magnetic fields, you might suppress these instabilities. Yeah, the camera is rotating around the um, around the super bubble. Okay. 
gave you is really important. Uh, actress, next point. Um, so that's a. Um, so we expect X-rays in our simulations because we have a mixing layer. Uh, so this is a slice, a pre-supernova slice of one of our simulations. Um, here is uh, so this is the um, this is the shell. Uh, this is the density of inside the supernova is a few times uh, ten to the minus seven. Sometimes it gets below that. And uh, <coughs> this is the mixing layer here. So this is clearly resolved our simulation. This is about um, the, um, uh, the numerical resolution that we have, and um, so the uh, points are closer here. So this indicates that we resolve the mixing layer. Um, and uh, this line here is this conduction solution from McRae and McClough 1988. And you can see that um, when the density gets significant, uh, this is um, much um, uh, much smaller width. Uh, compared to the mixing layer that we get here. So um, I think it's, uh, the correct conclusion is that in this case that we simulate uh, the uh, dynamical mixing uh, induced by the instability dominates. Uh, we get about a factor of 10 enhancements, and that's important for X-rays, because if you run a shock wave um, in this uh, kind of density, it will produce hot gas, uh, and that be very faint that you hardly can see in X-rays. If you run uh, your shock into the dense shell, uh, then it will slow down quickly and it will not produce x rays. But if you run your shock into such a mixing layer, that's ideal for producing x rays. So, and that's also a clear um, distinction between these two models, the weakly and the strongly dissipated models. Uh, so if you want, in this framework, if you want to produce x rays, uh, you need to involve a photo ionized layer. That's fine. There will be a photo ionized layer. And you need to explode your supernova very close to the shell surface because, as we said, um, the um, shock in such a supernova will turn subsonic very quickly. So before it does that, uh, it needs to reach the shell wall. That's why it needs to do it off center, very close to the shell wall. And then you get X rays and some part of the shell. Uh, not so in our models. We can get X rays everywhere. In particular, we can get shell structure. Uh, that's because um, the bubble energy is low and we get a shock. So we did the X-ray analysis of our um, simulations. We used um, Mikkel models for the experts, so these are plasma emission models that you can get from the XPEC code used for analysis of X-ray data um, uh, very widely. And we used um, spectra from that uh, code in the um, uh, steps of uh, delta KG of 0.1 KV. All of that with our simulation data, this gives us the spectra here. Um, so this goes from 0.1 to uh, 20 keV. And this is a logarithmic scale here. And uh, so the first spectrum is the black one here. Uh, that's uh, what we get in the first one we phase. Uh, so this is a fairly faint, um, uh, fairly faint X-ray spectrum everywhere. When the first supernova is uh, um, is produced and the shock has not yet reached on the shell wall, it's somewhere in within the super bubble. We first get an enhancement of the hard X rays. This by about a factor of 10, but this is still quite faint, so I'm not sure if that's um, possible to detect that. But when the shell actually, inter when the shock actually interacts with the mixing layer near the shell walls, uh, we get a strong boost in X rays. Um, all over, all over the spectrum, especially in soft X-rays, by a factor of about 100. And I think this uh, clearly nicely demonstrates what uh, Sally has um, said in her talk, that we do expect that um, super bubbles, once they uh, have a supernova, actually get X-ray wide. That's what we see in the simulation. Um, so here's an evolution of the X-ray properties. Um, I show here gas in different temperature ranges. Here's a spectrum. This is 0.01 to 1 kV gas. Uh, this is 1 to 2 kV gas. This is 2 to 4 kV gas. This is 4 to 10 kV gas. This is the column density of all gas. And um, so uh, you can see that whenever a supernova comes, uh, we first get bright in the hard X-ray lens. And, uh, 
then when the supernova shot actually impacts the shell, you get a um, shell structure. And then soon um, you also get uh, structures throughout the um, supernova in the soft x rays. I run this again. Uh, it's also important. So mixing and bubble merging is also very important here. So here you can see that um, the bubble uh, interface erodes, and because of the mixing, you get a strong emission in the secondary bubble, whereas the energy actually comes from this star at this moment. Now there's a supernova, get the shell, um, uh, shell structure, uh, there's more energy than coming from the secondary stars. Uh, you get this phase of distributed and uh, shell structure when the supernova in different wind phases come. Um, if you look carefully in the different bands here, you also expect to see spectral index variation. So how does this compare to observations? Um, I think, well, reasonably well. Uh, so this is a plot of X-ray observations of LMC super bubbles. Uh, this is luminosity, this is temperature. And uh, the um, blue crosses here are um, uh, the positions of uh, this sample of superbubbles for one for one assumption on the um, absorbing hydrogen column, and the red stars are the same superbubbles for another assumption of the um, absorbing hydrogen column, which is also reasonable. Uh, so you can see there are strong differences. I picked out uh, a particular superbubble, so these two points correspond to each other. So this gives you a feel of the uncertainty here. And uh, this point here, which I connected to this one, is a new analysis with Hickman and Newton, uh, which is uh, also completely different. And the difficulty here is, of course, you have a multi-temperature structure. Um, at least that would, um, would correspond very nicely to our simulations. Uh, and this makes the analysis difficult, and certainly uh, spectral capability, as uh, you have with Hickman and Newton, makes it even better. So luminosity is that you get uh, in the range of 10 to the 35 to 10 to the 37 for these X-ray bright and certain second for these X-ray bright super bubbles. That's about the uh, luminosity that we can also get. Temperatures are mostly below 1 keV. I think we can also say that we get that. And um, okay, if you look in detail, so the tracks are. Um, Clockwise, I believe. I think I've got it on this slide somewhere. Uh, now it's anti clockwise, sorry, it goes this way around. Um, so the space we cover is more in the lower left, uh, lower left uh, edge here. So there's clearly something missing in our simulations. One suggestion is that three stars does not fit for super bubble, fair enough. Um, and uh, the other suggestion is, of course, we neglect the same fields, which will influence the mixing in detail. Our resolution is wrong, and I've said already. Just the both of ionized layers, so all detail uh, will influence this problem. Uh, how does it compare to the integrated uh, luminosity of star forming galaxies? So you can say if you have star forming galaxies, all the super bubbles add up. So we get about 10 to the 4 ish, Q times 10 to the 4 of the input power that we have in the super bubble in X rays overall. And so you can just gain it with the star formation rate. And that's what I've, what I've done here. So this is the solid line here. This is integrated X ray luminosity that we expect for this kind of star formation rate. And these are the observations. And with the exception of the SFC, um, we uh, under predict this by a factor of about 10. I believe this is a good thing, so there's not a stringent test of our models, um, but uh, after all, there are other things in galaxies than super models, for example, X-ray binaries, and uh, people expected that X-ray binaries dominate, so I think this is fine. Um, we can compare it to detailed um, super model observation. So this is the Orion arena in the super model. And uh, this is uh, H, this is a alpha here, so this is the region that Sally showed before. This is the entire super bubble, and this is the corresponding X-ray image in two bands. So in the soft band, you see a strong enhancement towards the shell boundary, 
Um, so this is quite consistent with uh, actually entrainment and instability happening there and shocking uh, as we've seen in simulations. Uh, the uh, hard X-rays are different, so it would also be consistent uh, with global oscillations in the supernova, which we also see in the simulation. So that um, the supernova shockwave might have reached this thing in, uh, then oscillates it back, and so you get different radiometric compressions, which lead to different spectral in the supernova. Now, X-rays correlate with uh, shell velocity. Uh, this is also a result of, of study, actually. So actually, why super bubbles tend to be faster. And uh, I want to remark here, but Sally has already done it, uh, that it would be very nice to have for a larger sample here that actually confirms this. Uh, but nevertheless, there is a trend that X-ray bright super bubbles tend to have faster shells. Uh, so let's look at that in our simulations. So this is the shell velocity over time from uh, 3 to 10 mega years and the color of the symbol here gives you the, um, the x-ray luminosity with the red stuff being brightest and this is for comparison some uh, LMC simple bubbles. And this is what you expect from the self-similar model that I uh, showed a few times. And um, so clearly you see that um, the um, x-ray um, and it's it is correlated with an acceleration of the shell. So as soon as the shell accelerates, uh, you get mixing uh, and actually you produce the phase that is bright in x-rays. Uh, this happens for each and every single of the three that we have. So this is why it's in good agreement with observations. Cosmic rays. Um, so there's also a difference between the two models regarding cosmic rays. We expect strong shocks in the super bubbles, which means in, in, in our um, strongly, strongly dissipated model, we expect cosmic ray acceleration in super bubbles, um, which is not generally the case, or at least more difficult in the weakly dissipated model. Um, so here's a, um, here's a high energy image of 30 Duratus um, C. Uh, which this nice paper in the science from the Hess collaboration identified in the TEV emitter. And uh, the color that you see are non thermal X rays. Uh, so, uh, I talked about thermal X rays so far. Sometimes the non thermal X rays seem to dominate. We don't have cosmic rays in our estimation. Some of the people do. Uh, for example, this nice paper here. Um, and um, so, okay, for some conditions, apparently shock acceleration really dominates. Uh, this um, uh, TEV emission here requires shocks of about um, 3,000 kilometers a second uh, with a low density medium like 5 times 10 to minus 4, if you believe the electronic model. And this actually agrees with the conditions that we predict in super bubbles. So it's actually uh, if you believe the electronic model, it's a nice test of the density of the model. Uh, so, last point, aluminum 26. Two minutes is too short for that, but I would like to give you a case of that. Um, so, it's a radiative, radioactive trace element that's produced in massive star, and it traces hot gas flows. So, it's projected it will be wind and supernovae. Uh, we can measure the velocity because it has a, a radioactive decay line at 1.8 MeV, which you can resolve with integral. Um, so this is the um, galaxy map uh, of the aluminum 26, and for this inner galaxy part, we can measure velocities. Here they are, and um, what you see is a rotation in the expected sense. Uh, the only thing is that actually the um, uh, velocity that you get is much faster, so it's about 300 kilometers per second uh, maximum velocity than velocity of other gas places. So how do you explain that there's a uh, hot gas in the Milky Way which is much faster than all the other gas places? I believe it's a good case to assume that this has something to do with supermodels because that's what you get from merging supermodels when the hot gas streams from one supermodel into the other. Uh, we've done a detailed model which I have no time to explain, but in essence it works like this. Assume like in this galaxy, you have big super bubbles um, in front of the sun uh, at the spiral arm, 
the super bubbles um, are on one side of the spiral arm, the dense gets on the other side, you get the star formation, the super bubbles here, they all blow out into these big super bubbles, and this gives you a return velocity component of the spiral at the spiral arm uh, of the order of the sound speed in the super bubbles, which would be consistent with the number here. Uh, and uh, this could explain this observation. So my conclusions, um, I've talked a lot about the details of the high yield simulations. I think we can say that they are distinctly different uh, than the self-similar model that was in the literature before. In particular, we get much stronger dissipation uh, because of the mixing layer, that's the main thing here. Uh, therefore, the superbubbles get smaller. Probably, uh, it's, it's a significant contribution towards the power problem. Um, we get clumpy thick shells, uh, which I believe are at least sometimes seen in the observations of the filaments. Uh, we get a strong soft X ray emission, which I believe is in good agreement with observations. We get periodic shell acceleration correlated with X rays. Uh, strong shocks inside super bubbles, uh, which might produce cosmic rays. Uh, so I think this is, uh, and Sally had a, a point here that this might actually be very important. Uh, we get um, bubble merging with hot gas flows and typically a few hundred kilometers per second, which might be um, important to explain the Thank you. So I'm curious how how like I, I know you referenced a little bit uh, from from uh, Yuri's work how well this model or this picture of uh, much more mixing much more cooling scales up to the sort of really big super bubbles that we expect to be like driving up close and like the antenna like I there was a recent paper that did a survey of the antenna they found. For like 20 or so super levels, that these things had 100 parts plus parsec radii, uh, shell expansion velocities of 100 kilometers per second. It looked like they would be driven by like hundreds, maybe even thousands of massive stars rather than. So, in, in those cases, do you think that there would be enough energy input to swamp the extra cooling you would get in this mixing layer, or is this something that's kind of scaled for you? Currently, it seems to be scaled for to very high supernova densities. That's what I, that's what I get from the newest paper. Um, actually, so I think this is a prediction, and I haven't seen any supernovas, but I think uh, well, definitely should try to compare uh, the energy that you expect from the star formation to the supernova um, sizes and velocities. Yeah, because I mean, if, if this is the case that you only retain 1% of your energy, then you're not talking about star clusters with a thousand mass, you're talking about star clusters with tens, maybe hundreds of thousands of massive stars, and that's getting a little on the extreme side. Uh, no, it's not It's not like 1%, so um, for, the, for the highest economic frequency, you only get something like 10%. Yeah, okay. Okay. But that could depend on the density. That could depend on the density. Yeah, that's a weak factor. That's good. Yeah. So, I guess all these similarities, like, when relative to the animal are dependent, if you are seeing it in simulations, dependent on the uh, coordinates that you choose. So, how in this case, like, you have shown that uh, the thickness exhibition. It's actually coming from the mix, mixing layer, and how is it affected? If all these things are affected if you don't choose the for a Cartesian coordinate and rather do something else. Yeah, so uh, that's an important point um, that I, I didn't go into detail. So let's bring uh, up some pictures. So this is how it looks like. Uh, this is how our job is looked and uh, the ceiling of the uh, visual jump instability is here by the grid size. Uh, this is clear, so we expect the effect to be there analytically to check. Um, but the actual ceiling is by the grid scale. 
people have found different simulations where, uh, with, for example, with a spherical grid, where they found explicit seeding on certain scales. And I, I would say the result is generally similar. So the seeded development of the instabilities, or you can, of course, emphasize different scales if you see the different scales. This is true. So I had a question related to this. So those instability structures, like a, uh, how long they can survive, and what is the typical um, mass scale of those structures? Can stars form over there? Those instability structures. Yes. So the question was, how long do these um, structures survive, and is this um, relevant for star formation? Um, I think the answer is they survive reasonably long. So this is um, they survive over. Uh, 15 million years in our simulation, which is the relevant time scale for star formation. Um, we get clumps here um, if you look not at filaments, but at, um, let's say, bits of roundish clumps. Uh, in this simulation, with this particular setup, we get, which is I think about too unrealistic for star forming region, um, you get um, some sizes of about 100 solar masses. Um, so you could, in principle, even form a fat water of star, which I don't believe, you could in principle form the massive stars. Um, uh, but um, the dumps, um, these dumps would be genes unstable. We don't have self gravity in the simulation, but we can show that temperature tends to be of order between 10 to 20 Kelvin. And uh, there would be genes unstable, and therefore a really space star. And this is also seen in, in larger scale simulations of supermodels. I didn't have time to go to them, but I have to have a slide. Uh, so that's one. From, so these are larger scale simulations, um, which are also different perspective for supermodels. And if you look at these um, things here, uh, all interface system, people have shown that these two molecules and these two molecules, I guess, are. Uh, um, calculation for something that's similar to this here, uh, or a cipher that I lost here. So I think um, we expect to start with the question. What were you asking? What were you doing? What were you doing? Sorry, didn't you? <laughs> you already you answered, answered, answered this question. Yeah. Are there any? So in that other Cooper's solution, you raised the flash one of the five as as uh, this is something fractal, initial fractal is that uh, they show a lot of structure already in the thicker wall. So I wonder, should we worry about the initial condition that you're saying, for example, the should we worry that it is actually from here on the scale you're looking at, that that would create the thicker wall as a result of the good experience? The thickness of the other without the Yeah, you could have a good um, situation where the, um, uh, the cloud is, for example, spherical, uh, it has a density structure uh, that is, looks like filamentary already, and then you expand your supermodel into it, and uh, it, you get the same thing. That's the same as the cloud. Yeah, if you're in the center of the And then the, the uh, so MGNISM is plenty on small scale. You can explode your object, and then it has to propagate. It's plenty on the center of the scale, actually. I would think the structure bubble, which is my explaining some of the structure we actually observe without Christian. Yeah, well, if you look at the, um, I think it looks pronounced a bit, but if you look at the Wordpress guitar simulations, uh, we're starting exactly this. Uh, so you get a standard structure with uh, all these filaments gradually uh, going outwards. And I actually don't get much impression of the shell in that uh, situation. Whereas, I mean, if I look at some superbody shows, I get a clearer impression of the shell formation. If I didn't get a clearer impression of the shell, I don't think you can explain that. Um, just rain the of the white radius so that 
Let's suppose we look at this one, so the SH1 function. So, um, if I get you correctly, then I would have, in order to explain that with the pre-shaped medium, so I would, I can't take all the clubs in here, so otherwise I would see uh, filaments that go out here from here. Uh, I would have to put them here. So. The rosy, then. The yeah, definitely. That looks much more like a pre-shaped medium. That's the question I make. That's on small scales. This is, uh, this is First of all, it's what, 10 to 20 degrees out of the out of the pipe in the office. It's uh, 10 to 15, 20 degrees across. That's a really big structure. The initial turn of motion is pouring up into the it's, 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 a, a, it's a bit bigger. It's also close. It's about um, 50 bars in diameter. Yeah, it's, it's, it's small. That one's also probably more the extra bars. For example, it's a bigger. Uh, the fact that it is that diversity meets that. The eight mil meters has a big diversity in the field. So. So my question has been lots of people have done simulations of this, and some people go with skirt. I would have thought it made a big difference if I did that on the first day. Yeah. It's now 102. So I guess we should uh, thank this morning's speakers again.